Hi, good evening. Welcome everybody to the C Secret lecture. My name is Rani Avisar, I'm the Dean of the school. It's again my uh, true pleasure to uh, welcome everybody here. We have a fantastic lecture that is given by uh, one of our faculty that I will introduce in a few uh, seconds. The first thing that I would like to do is to thank the sponsors of this program. And uh, we have a long list with uh, some of the sponsors in this uh, room. I uh, see uh, uh, Cheryl Gold, who, who is in fact uh, one of the organizer of this uh, series and of the lectures that we see. So a great opportunity to thank you, Cheryl, for your uh, leadership in this program. Really appreciate. I see Bill Galway also is here and maybe a few others on this uh, long list of, um, of uh, uh, people that we need to thank for supporting this program. I believe that at the end of the lecture, uh, Jennifer Dillon, who is the, uh, our uh, assistant dean for advancement, will recommend to you what to do in order to support the program. So you'll hear a little bit more about that uh, by the end of the lecture. Uh, as I mentioned this evening, uh, I am truly delighted to introduce uh, Brian Soden, who is one of our uh, professors in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences. Um, Brian is an expert in climate, generally speaking, using uh, remote sensing techniques to, uh, I, to uh, uh, kind of uh, verify uh, the Earth's climate models that are being used to simulate the climate of the future. Uh, Brian uh, experienced uh, climate on his own. He first got an undergrad degree here in Miami to try to understand what the warm weather is. And then he went to Chicago to get his PhD to see the other extreme of the weather. And so uh, making sure that he knows really what he's talking about when we are talking about warm and uh, hot weather and cool weather. Um, uh, Brian got his uh, PhD, as I said, at Chicago, then went to uh, Princeton for a few years where he worked as um, a lecturer and a scientist uh, working for one of the NOAA labs uh, that is very well known in the field of the geophysical fluid uh, dynamics. He was then recruited by Rosenstiel and did his entire uh, career as an assistant associate and a full professor here. Uh, since uh, 2000 something, so uh, for a while. Um, I just want to say a couple of words, you know, we do have a few outstanding professors at the university and uh, certainly at the Rosenstiel School and uh, you have seen some of those. But uh, you know, occasionally we have also outstanding professors that are doing much more uh, for the community and certainly for the school. And Brian is one of those people that uh, served for a very long time as the associate dean for graduate program and uh, running, literally developing, helping me develop the professional masters that uh, we have developed at the school here that turned out to be uh, relatively successful. I mean, it's very successful for the students that are in there, gives them the, gives them the, the tools uh, to be able to find a job and uh, also a great uh, uh, source of uh, pride for the, um, for the school. In addition to that, Brian uh, is, uh, is of course um, a fellow of the American Meteorological Society. He's also a fellow of the American Geophysical Union. He has served on multiple panels for NOAA, NASA, uh, you know, everything that, uh, that is uh, influential. He also was the lead author for some of the IPCC uh, chapters, I believe in 2007 and 2013, right? And this evening he's going to uh, speak about a very hot topic as the climate uh, seems to have more and more impact on us. Uh, we are starting to think uh, maybe finally on some solution to mitigate the impact of the climate change. And that's what Brian is going to be talking to us about this evening. So Brian, thank you very much and welcome again, everybody. Okay, thank you, Ronnie. 
And I also want to extend my thank to C Secrets and all the sponsors for giving me the opportunity to speak to you this evening. And uh, I'm especially grateful for the beverages that were provided because what I'm going to be talking about this evening may seem a little more reasonable after you've had a couple glasses of wine. <laughs> Before I got started, everybody had a chance to go outside and experience the eclipse yesterday? It was pretty cool, right? Now, did you all notice that uh, a little dip in the temperatures when the eclipse came by, right? Because the moon's blocking some of the sunlight coming in. So uh, my mom and sister actually live just outside of Dallas, right under the totality of the path. And the closer you get to the path of totality, obviously, the larger the cooling is going to be. So when I found out that my lecture is going to be the day after the eclipse, I, was, I sent my mom a... Uh, a thermometer, and I said, Mom, you have to help me out here, you have to do a little experiment. So uh, she went out and, and took temperatures, and you can clearly see the dip in temperatures, you know, minimizing right during the eclipse. And okay, that makes sense, right? Because we're blocking some of the sunlight, and so that's going to cause a cooling, right? You're getting less sunlight at the surface. But the, the cooling from an eclipse is obviously very localized, right? and, it, and it's uh, very transitory. Right? But what if we could do something like that, not just over Dallas, but globally? Right? What if we could reduce the amount of incoming sunlight globally, and not just do it for an hour or two, but sustain it for decades? Right? That's what I'm going to be talking about today. That's the idea behind climate engineering. Right? So it's the deliberate manipulation of the environment in order to counteract the effects of global warming. And this is, as Ronnie said, kind of a, a, a very new and, and growing area within the field of climate change. So it kind of goes by a lot of different names. You may have heard it referred to as geoengineering or solo ge solar geoengineering, solar radiation modification. The nom de jour is climate intervention, recent uh, National Academy report out of, about it uh, a few years ago. And, but the basic idea here for all of these things is to modify the flow of energy into the climate system in order to offset the effects of increasing greenhouse gases, right? And that may seem like kind of a far-fetched and crazy idea, but some pretty smart people have actually suggested doing that. Uh, this is Edward Teller. You may better know him as the father of the hydrogen bomb. And uh, you may better recognize him from the character that played him in the movie Oppenheimer, right? So he, uh, Teller was the guy that near the end of the movie, he uh, testified against Oppenheimer to deny a security clearance, so kind of a bad guy there. But in the 90s, he was actually concerned about how increasing CO2 was causing the planet to warm, and he wrote a paper noting that if we just reduce the amount of incoming sunlight by a very small amount, we could more than offset the warming from increasing CO2. Now, as you might guess, not everybody is a fan of this idea. Uh, this is a quote from former Vice President Al Gore, who certainly knows a thing or two about climate change. And uh, you can see he called it insane, utterly mad, and delusional in the extreme. So this is a very controversial topic. And it's not just controversial in the political arena. It's also very controversial in the scientific community. There are a lot of climate scientists who think we should not be doing research on climate engineering. And the concern is not so much about the science of climate engineering, but about the psychology of climate engineering. And the concern is that if people find out that there's another way to cool the climate, besides reducing greenhouse gas emissions, right, then they won't be so inclined to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And I want to make one thing very clear, that you cannot overstate the importance of reducing greenhouse gas emissions if we're going to stabilize the climate. There is no way to stabilize the climate without bringing our greenhouse gas emissions down to zero. Full stop, right? But uh, climate change is happening now, and it's continuing to get worse. 
And so this is a graph of global temperatures uh, going back to 1850. And many of you are probably aware that last year, 2023, was the warmest year on record, right? But I think even more concerning than that was that 2023 also set another record and that we had our highest rate of emissions of carbon dioxide in 2023. So we're going completely in the wrong direction if we're going to stabilize the climate, right? If we're going to stabilize the climate, we need to bring our net greenhouse gas emissions down to zero. Right? So if we want to limit the damage due to climate change, I think it's important that at least we consider the options that are available from climate engineering in addition to what can be done through reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and climate adaptation. So in order to stabilize the climate, we need to get to a net of zero for greenhouse gas emissions, net zero. So this graph shows a possible scenario of how that could be done in this century, before the end of the century, how we could get to a net zero and keep global temperatures below two degrees. So what's shown on the vertical axis is the global greenhouse gas emissions expressed in gigatons of CO2. A gigaton is a billion tons of CO2. And the brown shaded areas show the greenhouse gas emissions CO2 and then other greenhouse gases like methane expressed in terms of equivalent CO2. The green area shows future projections under this scenario of what would have to be done in terms of mitigation. Mitigation means simply reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. How do we do that? We replace fossil fuels with renewable energy, solar and wind, right? So that's the green area. But you notice that that doesn't get us all the way to zero, right? It gets us down a lot but we're still left with about 20 gigatons per year of CO2. And that's because they're keeping these scenarios realistic, and there's a lot of areas of the economy that are hard to decarbonize. Things like steel manufacturing, cement, transportation, shipping, and so forth. And so they have something called negative emissions. Negative emissions uh, is also something called carbon dioxide removal. This is where we go into the atmosphere and remove CO2 from the atmosphere from our previous emissions, right? So in order to reach net zero and keep uh, temperatures below two degrees, we have to have both of those. We have to have aggressive reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. And we also have to have a significant contribution from carbon dioxide removal, negative emissions. And just to put that in perspective, in the last half of the century, this is between 10 to 20 gigatons of CO2 per year that we have to remove from the atmosphere. And to put that uh, into even more perspective, how much is 20 gigatons of CO2? Well, if you add up all the current emissions from the US, all of the current emissions from Europe, and all of the current emissions from China, that is 20 gigatons per year. So it's an enormous amount of CO2. We need a significant contribution for carbon dioxide removal. And carbon dioxide removal is one form of climate engineering, right? I'm going to talk about another version of it, which is solar radiation modification, reflecting sunlight. But another form is carbon dioxide removal. I'm not going to go into details on this, but I will uh, make a few points. Uh, the nice thing about carbon dioxide removal is it directly counteracts the effects of increasing CO2, right? It directly addresses the problem that we're facing, which is climbing uh, concentrations of greenhouse gases. But there are some challenges that it faces. There's a lot of different ways that we can do carbon dioxide removal that are being explored, but there's challenges. One is that it's expensive. Uh, the estimates vary anywhere from 50 to as much as $400 a ton. But let's take a, a value of $100. At $100 a ton, if we're going to remove between 10 and 20 gigatons per year, that's one to two trillion dollars per year we're spending to remove previous emissions. It's much cheaper to not emit CO2 than it is to recapture it after you've emitted it, right? Like a factor of 10 at least, right? It's much cheaper to mitigate than it is to remove it, but uh, we're not at a stage where we've we mitigated enough at this point. But even if we can get the cost down, there's still a problem of scale. 10 to 20 gigatons is a lot of CO2. 
There's a lot of different options, a lot of different negative emission technologies out there. None of them as yet have proven that they can get to the scale necessary to remove that amount of CO2. So there's lots of options that are being pursued, but there's nothing that's feasible yet. There's no guarantees, and we don't really know when that will become available, right? It may become available too late. So the reality is, while we have made progress in mitigation, we need to make a lot more progress. And that scenario I pre presented of reaching net zero before the end of the century, that's going to be very difficult to make. If I'm a betting person, I'm going to go on the over, personally. Right? So our current pledges and policies are not large enough or soon enough to make that scenario and keep global temperatures well below the two degree limit set by the Paris Agreement. Current policies and pledges put us at somewhere between two and a half and three degrees by the end of the century. That's more than double the amount of warming that we've seen so far. So let me present another scenario. Okay, there's no units on this. We just have time on one axis and temperature change on the other. And let's say at some point uh, we do aggressively cut our greenhouse gas emissions. And we do scale carbon dioxide removal to a magnitude required to pull out significant amounts of CO2. But we don't do that soon enough. And at some point, we pass a threshold where the warming and the environmental harm and the human suffering become too great. And we want to put a stop to it and we want to put a stop to it immediately. That's the scenario in which solar geoengineering is being considered, right? That we can begin to reduce the amount of sunlight coming in so that we can stabilize temperatures at some target level. And if we do this, we believe we can alleviate most of the extreme impacts of climate change. Okay, so now I'm going to go in and talk about some of the different ways in which we can do this solar geoengineering, but I want to make a few points first. One, solar geoengineering is not a substitute for emission reductions. We absolutely have to bring net greenhouse gas emissions to zero if we're going to stabilize the climate. There's no other way. It is a supplement to emission reductions. It is a Band-Aid that buys us time to get our act together to cut our emissions and to scale up CO2 removal. And I do think it is important that we should at least explore the options that we might have available, what their potential risks are, what their potential benefits are, and how feasible they are. The other point I want to make is that we're just talking about research here. And virtually all of the research that is being done on this topic is done on computers, on computer simulations of climate. There's only one field experiment that I'm aware of, and I'll show a slide from it. Everything else is being done on computers. And any deployment of solar geoengineering at a scale that would affect climate is decades away. Right? So it's not something that's being talked about being deployed now to try to change climate. This is decades away. OK. so. Uh, there's a variety of ways at which we can do solar geoengineering. I'm going to focus on two of them, the two main ways. And the idea here is, again, to cool the climate by reducing the amount of sunlight coming in, just like the eclipse. Right? And both of these ways involve injection of aerosols into the atmosphere. Now, an aerosol is any tiny little particle, it could be solid or liquid, that floats around in the atmosphere. There's natural aerosols like dust and sea salt. There's anthropogenic aerosols from the combustion of fossil fuels. Uh, and they're ubiquitous in the lower atmosphere. There's aerosols in this room right now. You just can't see them. They're so tiny, you could put like 50 of them in the width of a human hair, right? So we're not putting anything into the atmosphere that's not already there, right? There's already aerosols in the atmosphere. We're just adding aerosols in certain places in order to reflect more sunlight. And there's two locations. One is called marine cloud brightening. And that's where we inject aerosols 
down in the lower part of the atmosphere over the ocean and try to get these aerosols to mix in with certain type of uh, marine cloud cover, right? So this is very close to the surface. And we try to make those clouds brighter so they reflect sunlight. The other area is we put aerosols up high in the atmosphere in a layer called the stratosphere. And we have those aerosols themselves reflect sunlight back to space, right? So there's two different approaches to this. First, I'm gonna talk about marine cloud brightening. So this is a satellite image of uh, clouds over the North Atlantic. And these clouds are stratus and stratocumulus clouds. So uh, you've all seen the, these are kind of very low, very horizontally extensive cloud cover, close to the surface. They're kind of the gray, depressing days you have. We actually had a lot of them out this morning. And uh, they don't really rain very much. They might drizzle a little bit, but that's it, all right? But what you'll notice is crisscrossing through this cloud deck are a lot of artificial looking features, a lot of lines, right? They almost look like contrails, but they're not produced by planes, they're produced by ships. And what happened, cargo vessels and other large vessels are going underneath the cloud cover, and the emissions from those ships are causing the clouds to get brighter. So we call these ship tracks. These are all ship tracks here, right? And so the way that process works is that when uh, a large cargo vessel is burning marine fuel or diesel fuel, it's emitting carbon dioxide, but it's also emitting another gas, sulfur dioxide, SO2. And when that SO2 mixes with water vapor, it forms a little aerosol particle called sulfate, a little sulfate aerosol. Those aerosols mix into the cloud deck, and they increase the number of cloud droplets, which makes the cloud brighter. And that produces a little track behind the ship of where it went. And so one of the points is marine cloud brightening is not new. We've been doing this ever since we've had ships crossing or going across the oceans, right? There's marine cloud brightening going on right now. It's just not intentional, right? It's inadvertent. But what's being proposed here is to do that on a much larger scale to introduce a lot more of these aerosols into the right marine clouds in order to make them brighter and reflect more sunlight back to space. Now again, most of this work is being done on computer simulations, right? But there was the first field test of this last summer over the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And you're probably aware the Great Barrier Reef has suffered massive coral bleaching over the last two decades, right, due to warming temperatures. So this is in part an attempt to see if they can offset some of that warming in order to help uh, prevent further damage to the corals. <clears throat> um, but what they're doing here, so this is a picture off the back of a ship. This is from Southern Cross University in Australia. And what you see here is a sprayer. So they're not introducing aerosols through the combustion of fossil fuels, it's not the exhaust from the ship. They're actually using the sprayer to inject aerosols into the lower atmosphere. And these aerosols are not sulfate particles, but they're actually taking ocean water out, spraying out a very fine mist of seawater. Those droplets evaporate and they leave behind sea salt aerosols, just like table salt, very, very tiny pieces of table salt. And so if you see all of this kind of fuzzy white stuff in the foreground, that's all sea spray. Those are all the aerosols they're trying to inject. Now, the clouds they're trying to make brighter are back here. And unfortunately, those are not stratus or stratocumulus clouds. Those are cumulus clouds, and they're much less effective for marine cloud brightening because, as you can see, they're not very extensive horizontally. So this is in part uh, desperation to try to save the barrier reef because these are not the right, I knew going in that these weren't the best clouds to try to do this experiment on, but they needed to try something, right? Uh, but it's also a, a nice field test to study how these aerosols spread out and if there is even a, a measurable signature in brightening the clouds, and the early research suggests that there was, this wasn't done at a scale where it could really produce a significant change in temperature over the reef. This was just the first attempt to see how it would work. 
But this is one of the challenges that marine cloud brightening faces. That you can't really do it everywhere. You know, you're really limited to regions where you have this type of cloud, the marine stratocumulus cloud cover, and those aren't found everywhere. So that means you can't do marine cloud brightening everywhere, which means you can't reduce sunlight equally everywhere. You can reduce it more in some regions, less in others, and if you have no clouds, it's gonna be very difficult to reduce it at all, right? So you don't get a uniform reduction in sunlight. That can introduce patterns of temperature change, which, you can, which can alter weather patterns, right? So that's one of the challenges that marine cloud brightening faces. Now, this other approach, stratospheric aerosol injection, doesn't have that problem. It can do a very uniform distribution of aerosols in the stratosphere and reflect sunlight very uniformly. So it can give you a much more uniform reduction in sunlight at the top of the atmosphere. So again, this cools uh, uh, the, the, the climate by reflecting more sunlight back to space by these aerosols. We put them in the stratosphere. Where exactly is the stratosphere? Well, you've all probably seen it, or you've all at least seen one of these. This is the classic anvil-shaped thunderstorm cloud that we see in the summertime, right? And that flat top to the thunderstorm actually marks the boundary between two different layers of the atmosphere. Underneath it, we have the troposphere. This is where all the weather happens, right? And above that, we have a layer called the stratosphere. And this is a very stable layer. Most of the winds are horizontal. There's no weather there. There's no clouds. There's no rain, right? And so why do we, we want to put aerosols in the stratosphere because if we put aerosols in the troposphere down here, they're going to get incorporated into cloud droplets and the cloud droplets are going to form rain and the rain is going to pull the aerosols out of the atmosphere. That's the main way that we move aerosols in the atmosphere is through rain, right? So an aerosol in the troposphere lasts only a week or two at most. Right. But if we put aerosols in the stratosphere, there's no rain there. The only way those aerosols get out of there is just through gravitational settling. And they're so small that it takes a very long time. An aerosol in the stratosphere will stay there for a year or two. Right. So that means we don't have to replenish aerosols as frequently if we put them in the stratosphere. And the other advantage is there's very strong horizontal winds there that disperse the aerosols more or less uniformly throughout the globe. So we can get, just with a few injection locations, a much more uniform reduction in sunlight. So the idea here is that we could fly planes, up to around 20 kilometers or so is the upper limit where we can get specialized aircraft. And we can spray aerosols into the stratosphere. Or we can put a tethered balloon all the way up to 20 kilometers. That seems a little crazy to me, but they say, yeah, they think they can do it. Put a tethered balloon and a hose attached to it and start spraying aerosols up to that. It sounds, yeah, wild. <coughs> um, but there actually is some precedent for this as well. Whenever we get a really strong volcanic eruption, the last one was Pinatubo in 1991. But there have been a lot of volcanoes in history that have done something similar, where they inject aerosols into the stratosphere. Actually, they inject, again, sulfur dioxide as a gas. That gas gets converted into tiny aerosol particles, and they stay there for a couple years, reflecting sunlight back to space. Right? And so we know after Pinatubo, there was in fact a cooling, right? And it happened pretty quickly, you know, within a few months, you saw a significant cooling after the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. <clears throat> now, one of the other nice things about stratospheric aerosol injection is that because we have this natural precedent, we know nothing too terrible will happen if we put sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere, right? The worst thing that happened from Pinatubo was the eruption of Pinatubo itself and everything that happened in the Philippines. The stratospheric aerosols themselves, it caused a cooling, but that was about it, right? So there's precedent that, you know, we're not gonna shake things up too much. Now there's no field work being done on this yet, but again, there's lots of computer simulations of climate that are being done, and this shows an example of what happens. On the left, we have a business-as-usual 
greenhouse gas emission scenario for the 21st century. So we're just burning CO2, adding it to the atmosphere without any attempt to reduce emissions. On the right is that same emission scenario, business as usual emission scenario. But in addition, we're injecting aerosols into the stratosphere. And even under this very high end emission scenario, we can keep global temperatures from increasing. And we can do it in a way that doesn't introduce significant spatial changes in the pattern of temperature. So we can reduce global temperatures, and by the end, this is approaching four or five degrees global warming at the end of the 21st century. We can offset all of that warming with stratospheric aerosol injection. Other studies have shown that not only does it reduce uh, or prevent any change in global mean temperature, but it also reduces the risk of uh, extreme climate hazards like heat waves and temperature extremes, droughts, floods, rainfall extremes. It slows the rate of sea level rise. It can reduce hurricane intensity. Stratospheric aerosol injection can reduce all of these different climate extremes compared to what would happen under uh, a business as usual emission scenario, right? <clears throat> so those are the two main ways in which uh, solar geoengineering is being studied to uh, offset warming. Now I'm going to talk about uh, another approach that is being developed here at the Rosenstiel School in collaboration with colleagues at Princeton University, and it's being funded by the Simons Foundation. And this is based on work from two of my former students here, Hao Jia He and Ryan Kramer. Uh, they both got their PhD here. Hao Jia just graduated last year and he's gonna be here next month to receive the Walton Smith Award for best PhD dissertation. But part of his dissertation was this paper that came out in Science, and the premise of this paper, uh, one of the things that came out of it was that you can weaken the greenhouse effect both by reducing the concentration of CO2, which is kind of obvious, but also by changing the thermal structure of the upper atmosphere. And so the way this works is that the greenhouse effect really uh, operates by reducing the amount of infrared heat emitted to space, right? And so that happens, the surface, because it's warmer, emits more infrared energy than the atmosphere. The atmosphere is colder, so when the CO2 absorbs some of that infrared heat and emits it out to space, it's emitting less because it's cooler. Colder objects emit less energy than warmer objects, right? So this means the concentration of CO2 really depends on two things, or the greenhouse effect depends on two things, the concentration of CO2 and the difference in temperature between the surface and the level in the atmosphere where CO2 emits the space. If the surface and the atmosphere had the same temperature all the way up, there would be no greenhouse effect no matter how much CO2 you had, right? Because it's all emitting the same amount of infrared energy, right? There would be no reduction in that. So this means we can weaken the greenhouse effect by both reducing CO2 or heating the level of the atmosphere where CO2 emits the space. So that raises two questions. One, how do you heat the atmosphere where CO2 emits the space? And we do that by putting, instead of a scattering or reflecting aerosol like sulfate, we put in a dark aerosol like black carbon that actually absorbs a little bit of sunlight. And that can heat that level of the atmosphere. Now where in the atmosphere does CO2 emits the space? It turns out it's actually even higher in the stratosphere. It's about 30 to 40 kilometers. So you can't get there with airplanes. That would have to take some kind of rocket-based system to deploy it there. But all of this research is all very new. We've just started this in the last few months, right? So this is a very new approach to trying to do geoengineering and very recent research on this topic. And in fact, I'm gonna show you some computer simulations to see if it actually worked or not. And these are literally, this plot is literally like a week and a half old, right? It's, it's that recent that these results came out. And so this shows the temperature change that would occur if you put, this is a change in global temperature, if you put five teragrams of sulfate, five teragrams is five megatons, 
right? If you put five megatons of reflecting aerosol in the stratosphere, you could cool it by, you know, let's say six tenths of a degree. This is the same simulation, but instead of a reflecting aerosol, we put a tiny absorbing aerosol, and we put a lot less. We put only one-tenth as much, a half a teragram. And we even get more cooling. In fact, one of the encouraging things about this approach is it's per unit mass, it's about 15 times more effective than a reflecting aerosol. Right? So we have to put a lot less aerosol up there in order to get this effect. Now, I've kind of talked about, you know, the good side of how solar geoengineering can offset the warming, but there's also side effects, right? And in fact, there's a pretty long list. Uh, Alan Robach, who I know very well, published a paper in 2008, uh, 20 reasons why geoengineering may be a bad idea. This is now updated to 28 reasons why geoengineering <laughs> may be a bad idea. I'm not gonna go through all 28 here but I'll just touch on a couple. One is that we can offset the warming, but we can't offset the increase in CO2 by solar geoengineering, right? That takes carbon dioxide removal. So ocean the oceans just continue to become more acidic as we increase the amount of CO2. The other thing is if for some reason our ability to deploy stratospheric aerosols, let's say, became interrupted, then we could see a very rapid warming back to what the business as usual temperature would be, right? We could experience a climate shock, and the rate of warming could be much faster than what we've seen so far just from increasing in greenhouse gases, right? So that could be a real problem. Um, we also know from some of the computer simulations that it can weaken the monsoons, which a lot of people depend on for fresh water. Uh, depending upon the type of aerosol you put into the stratosphere, it could slow or even reverse the recovery of the ozone hole, which could be a problem. Um, and it also affects the balance between direct and diffuse sunlight, which can affect agriculture and ecology. And it will also, if we put, depending upon how much aerosols we would put in the stratosphere, when you go outside on a nice summer day and you see those bright blue skies, they wouldn't be so blue, right? They'd be a little milkier, a little hazier. We would have better sunsets, though. <clears throat> but uh, a lot of the concerns aren't just the physical side effects. There's also concerns about governance and who controls the thermostat. Can we actually, how, how do we ensure equitable benefits between, of risk and benefits between the developing countries who are most likely going to be, be doing the deployment of this, if we were to do it, and the underdeveloped countries or developing countries which uh, you know, would not be really contributing to it, but would still be affected by whatever happens, right? Another concern is, can everybody get together and act together on a single plan and agree on that plan? Can we get all the countries to cooperate globally on this? Or if one country wants to put in one megaton of aerosols, another country wants to put in four, and another country wants to put in eight, what's going to stop that? Right now, there are no treaties, there are no international laws governing this. Right. And even if we could get global cooperation, what principle are we going to use? Is it do no harm? Or is it the good of the many outweighs the good of the few? Right. That's what Spock said. Right. He was a pretty smart guy. Right. But if you believe that, like I like that one, you have to remember that over half the world's population lives in Asia. Right. So you can do good of the many just by optimizing the climate over Asia, right? So the real challenge is here on the governance side of things. The other concern is uh, that it can be a slippery slope. Once we start controlling the climate, when do we stop? If we, do, if we get carbon dioxide removal online, what do we set the, the climate at? Do we go back to 1990 levels? Do we go back to pre-industrial levels? Or do we try to create something even better than pre-industrial climate? Right? If we want to reduce the number of hurricanes in the North Atlantic, 
research suggests we could probably do that, right? If we want to reduce the intensity of El Nino and La Nina events, there is some research suggests that we might be able to do that too. Right? Do we do that? Do we try that? It's kind of a slippery slope. Where does it stop? Right? That's what we call the end of nature, because we no longer live in a, in a natural climate. It's completely artificially made, like one of Isaac Asimov's books or something like that. Right? It does become science fiction. OK, so uh, just some concluding thoughts. So I think of uh, climate engineering as a bit like a parachute, right? Uh, you never really want to have to use it. But if you ever needed it, you'd probably be pretty glad it had it. Right? And I think of it the same way. If you had asked me that quote I presented from Al Gore, by the way, you may have noticed that was kind of an outdated picture of him. It was also a kind of a dated quote. That was 10 years old. I don't know how he feels about it now. Uh, but if you had asked me 10 years ago, I, you know, I wouldn't have been that extreme as Al Gore, but I, I, you know, I just wouldn't have think I, people would be seriously talking about it. But now I've changed my mind, right? I do think it's important uh, as a plan B, right? In case we are unable to bring greenhouse gas emissions down to where they need to be. And in case carbon dioxide removal technology takes longer to develop than uh, we hope it might, I do think it's important to at least understand what our options are, what the alternatives are, to buy us some time until we get our act together. Right? And with that, thank you. Thanks, Brian. Very, very interesting. Before I pass the microphone to uh, Jennifer that is going to organize the question, I am going to take the privilege of being the dean and ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it sounds to me that uh, in order to adopt any of those techniques, especially to get into the stratosphere, you need to invest an amazing amount of energy to bring aerosols into that layer. What's the gain versus the uh, the benefit, okay, of bringing such a large amount of uh, aerosols into the atmosphere? Well, financially, you know, so I kind of spoke about carbon dioxide removal, how expensive it is, $100 a ton. So uh, the estimates for the cost of something like stratospheric aerosol injection are much lower, right? They're on the order of tens of billions of dollars a year instead of a trillion dollars per year. So uh, it's not cost prohibitive. And that, in fact, could be one of the problems, because then if it doesn't cost that much and you have countries that disagree on how much aerosol there should be in the stratosphere, there's no financial disincentive for some other country to just pump another you know, two or three megatons of aerosol up into the stratosphere. Right? So those are, the, those are some of the estimates I've read. All right. Okay, Jennifer, all yours. Thank you again, Brian. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Just stick around for a second. Okay. I wanted to, before we jump into the questions, I do want to take a moment since this is our last Sea Secrets, and I want to encourage everybody to, um, we, I wanted to welcome and thank all of our, sp our sponsors for this year. Um, I want to make sure that we acknowledge all of them. I want to say thank you to Bank of America, the Shepherd Broad Foundation, William J. Galway, Cheryl Gold, the KB Life Enhancement Forum, the Key Biscayne Community Foundation, Joan McCann Family Foundation, Nicole and Myron Wang, St. Ord DeForest Stedman Foundation, and Southern Glazers Wine and Spirits. I'd also like to thank our team that helps put together our Sea Secrets. Um, Cheryl Gold, thank you so much. Deanna Udell, who's in our in our uh, office over here working to record everything. I'd like to say thank you to Tatiana and to Odalis and to, to David and to Maria. Thank you guys so much for helping us put this together.
One thing I wanted to say is next year, the University of Miami is gonna be celebrating our centennial, 100 years. And we're very excited about that. And one thing I'd like to say is if you'd like to join us and become a sponsor, every gift makes a difference. So this is my pitch. You're gonna help us get to 100 million in our centennial, that's our goal, and we're working very hard to get there. So without further delay here, I would like to go ahead and start saying some questions here, asking questions. Um, one thing, uh, uh, before we close the evening, I have one more, um, one more announcement. We're gonna have a student auction happening here on Friday, April 19th. And so if you have questions, please raise your hand. Our students will come around and bring the uh, microphone to you. Please ask your question and then hand the microphone back to the student and we're ready to, to roll. If somebody wants to, we have a, someone right here on the front. I'm assuming that the fact that your vi visual showed non-carbon uh, uh, dioxide greenhouse gases, the methanes and stuff, as fixed throughout was a, just a simplifying assumption, uh, or is that something that no one is even thinking can be changed? Yeah, um, I think that's a, a good question. I don't know the, the answer to that in that particular scenario, why they kept uh, things like methane uh, fixed in that. It doesn't necessarily make uh, that much of a difference in terms of the need for carbon dioxide removal to offset that. And I think that might have been an oversimplification. Uh, it seems unrealistic to me, but I'm not uh, a person that puts together those emission scenarios, so I can't answer that one. Yep, question over here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I made a little list of questions, but I'm just gonna have to pick one. <laughs> Very inspiring stuff, thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, I'm a current undergraduate student at University of Miami, so I'm very grateful that I have the opportunity to come and listen to amazing talks like this, okay. thank you very much. Um, so the question that I'm gonna go ahead and ask is, uh, so you got back to um, right, what's natural. Um, when we talk about geoengineering and um, how it can just potentially get to this um, science fiction future of we're shaping the natural world through all this. Um, so put it there. Um, at that point, is everything we're learning about um, with in, in education now focused on that, like from this um, idea of now what is human engineered? Are we forgetting about what's natural, like the natural weather patterns. Are we forgetting about how the world naturally operates? And I think it really ties back into social media. I mean, it's, if you think about Facebook or Instagram or anything like this, it started with this opportunity to connect people and enhance like how we spread messages. But it's gotten to the point where it's like, you know, at some point it's more effective to just talk to somebody face to face or to um, you know, knock on a door to spread a message rather than wanting to start an app or to do all this extra stuff. You, know, you can't forget what's natural, what's more effective that way. So I kind of think that you might get that point where you kind of lose touch, you lose pay, uh, base in education, what people are learning about at some point. Well, I, you know, I think it's a good point about living in a natural world, and I think we have lost touch with living in a natural world because no one here has lived in a natural world. Nobody's parents or grandparents have lived in a natural world. There has not been a natural climate here since, you know, before Abe Lincoln was president, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's true, uh, and it, you know, raises the question, you know, if we restore the climate to some, to some state, you know, you have to go back in the history books and read, you know, what was the climate like in Florida in 1850 or something like that, right? Um, I mean, we have records of that, obviously, but no one's experienced it. No one's felt it. No one's lived it in a very long time. Um, we know human creations Scientific and discoveries have always been challenging in terms of being good and bad sometimes. 
My question would be, is there any implication on the military level, this kind of engineering, could it be used by some country to like block sunlight for another or something? Like yeah, that? I mean, that's one of the concerns, right? Is that, uh, well, I mean, I think the first concern is that people just wouldn't agree and countries would do whatever is in their best interest. Uh, but you could envision sort of almost a climate warfare, right? Where you were trying to change the climate to make it worse in some other regions. There is, a, uh, there is a, an international law on the books regarding that, however, uh, that came out after the Vietnam War. I forget exactly what uh, the name of it is. I can't remember. But after the Vietnam War, the US during the Vietnam War had done uh, cloud seeding to try to increase the rainfall on the Ho Chi Minh Trail to make it more difficult to transport supplies and stuff along there. So they did pass a, a ban on environmental modification for the purposes of warfare. Now, that was done long before this whole idea of climate engineering was even being considered. Uh, whether that would really, you know, whether anybody's really going to listen to these things or not is a whole other question. Get, I, I, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm just going to ask, at this point, even if we instituted this, isn't there a certain amount of sea level rise that's already baked in, that's that, an unknown maybe? And then if that's true, then these kind of, because we already have the power right now to reduce carbon and we can't do it politically. So how how could... It's almost predictable that all of these other kind of like negative side effects will come into effect because we are already going to lose Florida and whatever, and so that's going to create a political reaction that's going to, you know, what I'm saying? Like this, this is almost predicted to have a negative outcome, given that we're already going to suffer a huge effect from climate change already baked in. Uh, you know, in terms of the sea level rise, well, in terms, let me. Uh, make two points. If we bring net greenhouse gas emissions to zero, right, uh, the, the temperatures will, uh, can stabilize within a decade or so, right? So we can keep surface temperatures from warming, uh, you know, within a decade or so after reaching net zero. In terms of sea level rise, sea level rise is, is really driven by the fact that there's more energy coming into the climate system than going out. When you have more energy coming in, that energy is stored as the ocean in terms of an increase in ocean heat content, which causes the thermal expansion of the ocean, which drives sea level rise. So once we uh, stop the net energy flow, uh, once we reach a net energy flow of in, in equilibrium, the same coming in, the same going out, that will stop the increase in heat content, and that should stabilize sea level rise. There are other aspects of, of uh, solar geoengineering that are focused on polar regions because the other contributor to sea level rise is ice melt from Greenland and, and Antarctica, right? So you can also even envision not a globally uniform solar geoengineering, but one where you place aerosols specifically in the higher latitudes to reflect more sunlight there to reduce the rate uh, of, of ice melt and, and possibly even re, uh, reverse the net ice sheet balance in those regions. So I don't think it is uh, a done deal that these things are baked in in the long term. Can you maybe explain again uh, why you, I'm sorry, what's uh, No, I see you. I was just trying to find where the voice is coming that's me, from. That's me. Uh, I didn't quite get why you get better results with absorbing aerosols rather than reflecting aerosols. That bit, a bit, that seems a bit counterintuitive yeah. to me. Um, yeah, I had to go through that quickly. But so we want to uh, we want to increase the amount of energy being emitted to space in order to weaken the greenhouse effect. Right? The greenhouse effect does the opposite; it reduces the amount of energy. So the amount of energy an object emits depends on its temperature. Hotter objects emit more energy than colder objects, right? So if we increase the temperature of the greenhouse gases like CO2, where they're emitting directly to space, then we increase the net emission of infrared energy to space, and that reduces the strength of the greenhouse effect, right? So in order to increase the temperature of that level, 
we want to put in something that absorbs a little bit of sunlight rather than reflects sunlight. So there we would put in a darker aerosol rather than a reflecting aerosol. This may be going a little too much into the weeds, but are there specific examples of countries that would greatly benefit or greatly be harmed by going back, say, to the 60s temperatures, going back to the 1800s temperatures, or going back even more artificially? Well, I remember, uh, I grew up in Iowa, and I remember being there one time and seeing a bumper sticker that said, Minnesotans for global warming. And, uh, you know, so I, I do think, you know, some of uh, the higher latitude, like if I was in Canada, I probably wouldn't be so concerned uh, about global warming as I am here in Miami. So, uh, yeah, are there, I mean, there are certainly places that suffer much more from global warming than, than other places, right? And uh, those, you know, often tend to be the less developed countries that really had no contribution to the problem to begin with. But, uh, so short answer to your question is yes. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned agriculture. From mm -hmm. my understanding, most of the plants that feed the world are high light intensity. They need a lot of sunlight. Uh, I worked at Fairchild for a little bit and we have shade houses you know, to grow other types of plants you know, that don't do so well. So are we kind of wanting to create a shade house all over the world that how you might, you know, to me, the world is already in famine. We can't feed, or we, we can't feed most of the people in the world, but we choose not to and oceans produce a lot of the oxygen we breathe and rainforests and it's big. Yeah, so uh, there seems to be, at least in the literature that I've seen, and I'm not that well versed in it, but from you know, the papers that I have seen, there's kind of mixed results in terms of the agriculture. Some things do better in part because you've, uh, you still have the increase in CO2, which is better for plants, but the temperatures haven't warmed as much. And so the plants can get a net benefit from the higher CO2 without the higher temperatures. I think that's the main driving factor. But there was an, I was just at a conference uh, a month or so ago, and one of the interesting papers there was that, uh, yes, like the agri I, if I recall it right, the agricultural productivity increased, but the protein content per crop decreased. Uh, I don't understand the reason for that. I just remember being surprised by that result. I think that was to be our last question for this evening. Thank you guys so much. I wanted to let everybody know all of these lectures are on our YouTube channel. So we'll be sending out an e-newsletter. If you're on our, our list, you should be because you're, you've signed up. We'll be sending that out. You'll be able to see all of the lectures if you missed any this year. And I wanted to say thank you, Brian. Thank you to Brian's mom if you're out there. <laughs> Take care and see you next year. Bye-bye.